Okay, hi, and welcome everyone. I'm Abby Jones with USAID's Water Office, and I want to thank everyone for joining us for this webinar hosted by USAID's Water Communications and Knowledge Management Activity. Today's webinar will explore the durability of outcomes achieved under USAID Senegal's Millennium Water and Sanitation Program, or PEPAM USAID, which closed in 2014. It's the fifth in a series of ex post evaluations conducted by Social Impact on USAID funded water and sanitation activities that have closed between three to 10 years ago. Previously evaluated activities are marked in blue on the map and are available on USAID's Water Sector Knowledge Hub, globalwaters.org, while evaluations underway are marked in red. Our intention with this series is to understand the durability of outcomes achieved through USAID's water and sanitation investments, and most importantly, why those results were sustained or not, to ensure USAID is poised to help partner countries on their journey to self-reliance. Today's speakers will highlight findings from the PEPAM USAID ex post evaluation, as well as how USAID Senegal's programming has built on this work in the years since the activity closed. Today's presenter is Holly Dents, a monitoring and evaluation specialist with the USAID Water CKM activity who leads this ex post evaluation series. USAID Senegal's WASH lead, Abdoulaye Boli, will serve as a discussant, and Carrie Nelson, a technical director from Social Impact who supported the evaluation, will also join the Q&A. Before we get started, a couple of things. First, we would really like to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation. So please ask questions, share comments, even challenge our ideas. To do so, you can use the question panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player to share at any time during the webinar. Note though that questions won't be answered until we hear from both the speaker and the discussant, but I will be organizing and grouping the questions and comments in the meantime. Second, I wanna flag that you can find the full PEPAM USAID evaluation and evaluation brief under the handout setting, as well as slides from today's presentation. Note that today's webinar is being recorded and the recording and related resources will be available next week on globalwaters.org. And finally, if you're having technical issues, our webinar technical team will do their best to assist you and will monitor the question box for any issues that you flag. I'll now turn things over to Holly to run through the evaluation findings. Thank you, Abby. Um, I appreciate it. Let me just try to get the slides to advance uh, one moment. Um, aha. Okay, so here we go. Uh, thank you, Abby, for the introduction and, and welcome again, everyone. As she mentioned, uh, my name is Holly Dents and I was a team lead for this evaluation. I am presenting on behalf of a larger evaluation team who I'll acknowledge at the end of the presentation. As you can see from this slide, we will walk through a pretty standard uh, format for presenting evaluation findings. I'll briefly review the activity background and evaluation design. Then I'll spend a majority of the time on the findings and of course we'll discuss key implications and recommendations. I also hope for a robust question and answer period so please do keep those, those coming. And I also, before I move on to the next slide, just want to preface um, the, the presentation with PEPAM USAID was an extremely complex and ambitious project and we hope that you do have a basic understanding um, from this presentation but there is a lot more detail so we're happy to answer any questions related to that or refer you to the, the full evaluation findings. So next, I'd like to share an overview of the program background. So as Abby mentioned, it was called the Millennium Water and Sanitation Program, or PEPAM USAID. It was implemented by Research Triangle Institute from 2009 to 2014 in four regions in southern Senegal. So with this slide and the next slide, I'll share an overview of the objectives, activities, and implementation approaches. And first, I'll highlight the objectives. The first objective was to improve local management of water supply and sanitation via strengthening governance at the village level. A few examples, certainly not exhaustive, uh, included setting up water and sanitation committees or revitalizing, revitalizing those and providing technical assistance. 
The second objective was to increase local demand for improved water supply and sanitation and hygiene through behavior change communication and social marketing programs. It is important to note that specifically the self-esteem, associative strengths, resourcefulness, action planning, and responsibility, it's a mouthful, um, SAR, and participatory hygiene and sanitation transformation FAST uh, methods were used to drive the behavior change. And these were used by NGOs, community members, and activists to catalyze such behavior change. The third objective was to strengthen local private sector um, enterprise capacity to provide the water supply and sanitation services. One of the activities that this included was setting up local drilling businesses and operations, as well as supply chains for water point parts and also providing technical assistance. The fourth objective was to increase local construction and rehabilitation of water supply and sanitation via some of the mechanisms I just explained, as well as training local entrepreneurs uh, that were sanitation masons, specifically to build uh, three types of latrines that PEPM USAID was promoting. And the fifth objective was to use community-led total sanitation to reduce or eliminate subsidies and to promote behavior change in households and Washington schools. So this took uh, the method of some activities like CLTS in communities and training NGOs on those. It is important to note that in this evaluation, we did not include an, um, uh, or assess the Washington Schools component. It was fairly small compared to the overall activities that PEPM USAID carried out. Next, let's talk about the specific implementation approaches. In the subsidy approach for water and sanitation services, infrastructure, so either um, at the household level, if it was sanitation, or at the community level, if it was water, was based off of de demand creation from community meetings. Subsidies included a 10% cost share by the community for a water point, and household latrines were anywhere from 30 to 65% if a PEPM USAID, one of those three models, were, were selected. For CLTS with a water incentive, it consisted of CLTS triggering in the traditional way, and then um, a carrot was dangled, and that was if they reached, if the community reached ODF certification status, this could lead to the option of a subsidized water point at a 10% cost share or a public latrine block. There was no subsidy, of course, for household sanitation. And then the final approach was an hi a hybrid of the subsidy and CLTS. And it is important to note that this came after the other two implementation approaches has, had been tried and best practices and learning were put into it. And so what this consisted of, consisted of was CLTS me methods and demand creation for water. After a CLTS triggering occurred, so approximately three months later, the community would be revisited and that would be the first time that a subsidy was uh, introduced. And the subsidy for water points in those communities were about a 10% cost share. And for latrine subsidies at the household level for these three PEPM promoted latrine types, it was the, uh, the households had to uh, contribute a bit more, so from 50 to 90% of the latrine costs. I also just want to note that across all three of these approaches, PEPM USAID encouraged community members to treat their water with aqua tabs, to build hand washing stations, and wash their hands at critical times. They also provided sanitation manuals and guides on latrine construction, maintenance, um, and referrals to trained masons as well. And so with this in mind, we designed um, this ex post evaluation and had uh, key questions related to water, sanitation, and hand washing. Specific to water, the evaluation team wanted to understand what is the level of service of PEPM USAID water points, which factors influence the sustainability of water services, and are women actively engaged in management and governance structures as promoted by PEPM? For sanitation, the evaluation team wanted to understand are households using and replacing their latrines, and what factors, including choice of approach, contributed to sustainability? For hand washing, we looked at what is the status of hand washing station, stations and practices today and which factors influenced hand washing behavior. So with those questions in mind, we, we designed this ex post evaluation using mixed methods and we conducted data collection from November to December of 2018. Our sampling frame included 202 villages across these approach types that I previously shared. And now I'll introduce a new nuance, which is we had three village types. There could be a water only, a sanitation only, or a water and sanitation village. We sampled across those as well. We collected 514 water user surveys, 
617 household surveys that focused on sanitation and hygiene practices, although there were some questions related to water. And during the household survey enumeration, we conducted observations of 551 latrines and 291 hand washing stations. Additionally, in Peppermi Osage water communities, we observed 169 water points. And a little preview into our findings, um, at the functioning water points, of which there were 105, we tested for E. coli and iron. At 64, we tested for fluoride, and you might be asking yourself, well, why only 64? And that was because in one of the four regions, there wasn't a concern of fluoride contamination, and therefore, there wasn't a need to test for it. In addition, we had robust qualitative data collection. Uh, there were 56 interviews with stakeholders, and stakeholders ranged from the local entrepreneurs to government officials to water committee members and local community members as well. So let's jump into to the uh, evaluation findings. Um, but before I actually do that, let me give you a few caveats, actually. So the first is that there wasn't an end of activity measure. Uh, so for example, an endline survey. So we can't make direct comparisons or linkages to sustainability. That being said, I think our findings will help paint a picture and, and give people a sense of where things stand now in these PEPM USAID communities. So now I'd like to orient everyone to PEPM USAID's achievements related to the uh, water point infrastructure. So 341 villages either received an, a new water point or a rehabilitated water point. And a vast majority of those sites, so 318, were just single boreholes with a manual pump with varying pump technologies that were selected based on a variety of factors, which you can find in our detailed report. Uh, the remaining 23 were larger multi-village systems often, or a water tower or solar pump or something slightly different. Uh, for the larger multi-village systems, these had a different management committee, which we'll talk about called an OSU4 a bit later. So now let's get to the results. In terms of functionality, 82% of respondents to the water survey said that they uh, found their primary water source functional uh, year-round. Uh, note, this may not have been the Pepmio USAID water source, but a primary water source. In terms of what we observed directly at Pepmio USAID water points, we saw that 63% were operational. In terms of reliability, overall, uh, water points were reliable, and but it is important to look at reported reasons for reliability concerns, and so we did that as well. And what we found was that water points being broken, seasonal fluctuations, and supply rationing were the primary um, challenges to, to water points not consistently having water. And while we're not able to get into it in this presentation, we do have detailed information in our report about the reliability being varied by region and pump type as well. So let's move on to water quantity. Uh, as, as many of us know, water quantity plays an important role in water seeking behavior. A majority, so 84% of water users reported that they were satisfied or very satisfied with the quantity of water that was produced by their primary water source. And two important um, direct observable um, kind of, I guess, proxies though for water quantity are stroke and flow rate. And at the PEPM USAID water points, the average stroke rate was 0.27 liters, whereas the industry average for, for similar pumps is 3.6 uh, liters. This does indicate that that is notably lower than the average, um, but it is important to note that this did vary by pump type, and specifically the India Mark pump performed best at 3.3 seconds a liter, so right up there with the average. And now we'll spend the rest of the slide talking about the flow rate. So at the PEPM USA water points, uh, the flow rate was 0.22 liters a second, whereas again, the industry average is 4.3 liters a second. Of note, uh, the mechanized pumps perform the best for this at 3.3 seconds a liter. And now, if you could draw your attention to the figure at the bottom of the slide, uh, what we can see here is if you look, you'll see the, the blue lines essentially are the industry averages and the, the red lines are, are, are observed at the, the PEPM USA water points. And what you can see here is that the PEPM points appear to essentially be performing lower at the lower end, if not well below the expected range um, for, for that pump type specifically. In terms of water quality, water users were satisfied or highly satisfied with the quality of the water that came um, from their, their water points. And this was uh, a very salient theme as well in the qualitative data. And so what I'm going to do is share with you now a quote from a water committee member who said, in this village, no one doubts the good quality of the water since they have had access to water from the boreholes. 
many of the diseases found in children and in the population in general disappeared. And our water quality testing results um, also supported this broadly positive view as well. Specifically, we found that E. coli was only present in seven out of 105 water points, and that iron was only present in one sample out of the 105 um, above that national standard uh, for iron. In terms of fluoride, five of the 64 were above the national standard. However, the national standard is more sensitive than the WHO standard, of which only three were above that. And so I think the overall takeaway from this is that overall, PEPMUSA water points, where they're functional, uh, the water quality is, is, is of, of good quality overall. So in terms of accessibility, uh, JMP and, and USAID follows this as well, you know, has the indicator that specifies that water collection should take no more than 30 minutes or less round trip, including wait time. And according to the water user survey, this does happen a majority of the time in, um, in, in, in PEPMUSA communities. However, it is always important to investigate the reasons when it's not happening. So 17% of respondents reported that they needed 30 minutes or more for a single trip to collect water. But where it becomes more interesting and nuanced is that most needed more than one trip. And so respondents were spending an average of 53 minutes per day to meet the water needs um, of, of their households. In terms of use, 62% of respondents reported using multiple water sources to meet their needs. And I would like to draw your attention to the, the figure on the, the bottom right of your screen. And if you look at the very bottom two bars, you'll see cooking and drinking water. And these are reported uses for PEPAM USAID water points. And as you can see, it's 96 and 98 percent, which is, which is quite high. And this aligns with what uh, we saw in the qualitative data as well. Uh, one of the things that people reported and, and we saw was that it is common for households to have or compounds to have uh, wells, open wells, unprotected wells, either on their compound or nearby that they use for other uses. And then um, they use the boreholes where possible for, for drinking water purposes. And now I'll sh share a qualitative slide that, um, that supports this. And it's from a water management committee member. And this member said, community members use the water points from, community members use the water from this water point for drinking and cooking because they are convinced of the drinkability of the water. And this is not the case with the other water points used for chores in the community that you can find that are, that are closer and more accessible to their households. So now let's move on to factors affecting sustainability. First, we'll discuss uh, water management and women's engagement. So I think we all know that a well-functioning water committee is a key factor to water point sustainability in terms of collecting water fees, management, and things of that nature. As I mentioned earlier, PEPAM USAID had several activities to support water committees, including the larger ASU4s who manage the multi-use systems. And they also had guidelines for women's involvement, specifically that they should um, hold 50% of the positions on water management committees. And what we see is that 87% of community members say that their water committee is active. 88% say that they hold regular meetings, and 66, or sorry, 63% say that they have ever attended a meeting. But despite these positive reviews from community members, an examination of key management practices promoted by PEPAM USAID revealed less than ideal adherence. And so it, for the 11 uh, water committees that we spoke to, only four were regularly holding monthly meetings. Uh, four, and not necessarily the same four, of the 11 were collecting meeting minutes, and only two published their meeting minutes, all of which were best practices PEPM put forth. In terms of water management, or sorry, engagement with women, 10 of the 11 water committees had at least one female member, and 17 of the 40 possible positions were filled by women. So this isn't quite 50%, but it is, it is close, and it is notable that that 50% is also um, supported by the government of Senegal. Moving on to talking about the financial practices of, of water committees and how that affects sustainability. So during implementation, um, PEPAM USA trained the water committees not only on these management practices, but financial best practices, such as keeping transparent records and opening bank accounts. And what we found was that record keeping wasn't happening. Of the eight water committees that gave us information on this, they just said they don't do this. They don't keep transparent records of expenses or revenues, and they weren't possible to view um, as well. And PEPAM USAID also provided guidance, uh, detailed guidance, on tariff setting for water committees. This was non-binding, but it was uh, 
very detailed. They looked at the water point type, the population, and did all sorts of costing to, to help set tariffs, um, but uh, certainly it is important to note non-binding. So four years after the activity closed, what we see is that 33% of users report paying for water, and they're paying an average of $22 a year for that water. It, it is interesting to note as well that users of the submersible pump frequently paid uh, more for their water or paid more frequently for their water and um, paid higher fees. But in addition, they proved to be the most reliable over time as well. And I think not surprising, we found that fee collection was positively correlated with functionality of water points. It's also worth noting that in the midterm evaluation, 65% of water points or water committees were cited as experiencing severe threats to their financial sustainability. So this was prior to PEPM USAID, you know, even finishing their activities, there were challenges around um, water point uh, tariff collection, essentially. And so now let's look at the figure, the amount of water feed pay, fees paid by pump type compared to expected O&M costs. And, and what we see here, um, of course, the, the blue is the expected costs and the red are the reported fees um, that, that are being paid. But what we see here is that respondents and villages with the mechanized pump are most commonly paying their water fees. Um, and this was a statistically significant difference um, with all comparisons to the others. And of note, those mechanized pumps are often in these multi-use or multi-village supplies as well. And, you know, it's important to talk about adequate tariff recovery is key to operational costs and maintenance. Um, and if, if it's not there, then those, those can't be met. And this is, was a, a barrier to uh, reportedly engaging the local entrepreneurs uh, after the activity closed. So the local entrepreneurs who were set up to support water uh, systems still exist and still have their businesses in most cases, but they don't have the contracts that PEPM had, had put, helped them put in place with these uh, water committees. And this, according to some of the qualitative data, um, stemmed from lack of revenue recovery or tariffs to have a consistent contract, although they do uh, work with these water committees, just not on a contractual basis. It's also important to note that the spare parts supply chain set up by PEPM uh, were no longer active from what we were able to ascertain. So now let's move on to sanitation uh, and, and shift gears a bit. So let me just orient everyone uh, to the infrastructure achievements that, that PEPM USAID made. Uh, they reported that 6,709 latrines were built, including 2,405 that were in the CLTS water incentive approach villages. It, it's also important to note that um, not all of those latrines were necessarily the three types that were promoted by PEPM. It was just if they built a, a latrine of any type um, as, as part of the uh, demand creation from the activity. And so what I'll do is let's just talk about these three bullet points at the top. Overall, what we'd like you to take away is that there were high rates of sanitation access. However, the PEPM USAID promoted latrines are not widely found based off of the observations that we conducted. And most importantly, from the slide, we found that 56% of hybrid village, villages had access to basic sanitation, which uh, was noticeably higher than the other arms, but we'll get into that in a moment. So now if you look at the, um, if you look at the figures, we're gonna go from left to right on your screen as you're looking at it. And we're building towards basic sanitation access as we go from one figure to the next. And so in the first figure, access to any latrine, what we see is that overall 92% of respondents reported that they had access. The primary goal of CLTS, of course, is to end open defecation. And to do so, people must have access to any type of latrine. So this is it seems to be effective both overall and especially in those CLTS water incentive um, villages. And both CLTS, of course, and subsidy are doing uh, quite a bit better or enough better than the hybrid approach. Moving on to the second uh, figure, what we see is any latrine with a slab. And here there's substantial decrease in overall access if, if you're looking at, of course, if there is a slab, it goes down to 69%. And notably the lowest numbers are in the CLTS water incentive villages. In the third figure, what we see is that um, there's a similar overall decrease and this one's looking at access to private latrines. So those are only used by members of their household. And it's pretty consistent along the arms, but we do see that the hybrid um, is performing the best there. Uh, 
In terms of the fourth figure, this is what gets us to basic access. And this is, of course, an important sector indicator. And what we see is that overall 47% of households have access to basic sanitation across these, these four regions and these approach types. But notably, 56% of the hybrid villages reported the highest proportion of, of latrines that met basic access. And this was followed by subsidies at 49%. And then there's a, a marked um, decrease at 36% for the CLTS with water incentives. The difference between the hybrid and subsidy approaches means and the CLTS water incentives were statistically significant. And overall, what this suggests to us is while the CLTS water incentive approach broadly facilitates access to a latrine, it does poorly in facilitating access to basic sanitation service. Let's look at latrine char characteristics. We know that those characteristics such as walls, roofs, doors, they're indicative of both quality but they also have implications for sustainability. The latrines we observed across approaches often lacked key superstructure components and privacy components um, as well as other features. Uh, notably, the CLTS water incentive villages appeared to have the poorest quality latrines across all these characteristics, whereas the hybrid and subsidy village um, latrine characteristics showed mixed results. So, for example, the hybrid village would do better on slabs, and then the you know the the subsidy village would do better on walls. Uh, this isn't presented here with a figure, but we certainly have one in our larger report if anyone wants to get down into the nitty gritty there. Overall, we see that 86% of observed latrines appear to be in use among approaches. And uh, in two slides, I'll share the breakdown with you by approach. 93% of households had no visible feces in their compound, which was balanced across these approaches. And overall, 68% reported that no one um, defecates, does open defecation, uh, which would be some, you know, some, some slippage. And then finally, looking at the figure on this slide, what we see is that 89% of respondents reported that they do have, um, they report using their latrine, which is right on par with 86% of observed latrine use. And notably, the CLTS water incentive had the highest report of use as well. Moving on to factors that affect sustainability, latrine repair is, is chief among those. And so what we see is that 49% of respondents reported repairing their latrines when there was an issue, and the highest rates of reported repair were in hybrid villages. Also along the lines of latrine repair, we found that the trained sanitation masons were valued, but they were infrequently consulted based off of the barriers that I'm about to discuss next. So it's also important to note that latrine Replacement was commonly cited as occurring um, across all regions and implementation approaches. However, for those that didn't, th these barriers existed. And one of those was full pits. I cannot tell you there should be like shining stars around those full pits. This came up in the quantitative, the qualitative, and was a significant issue. Um, and we do know that PEPM USAID had a pit emptying manual, but it, we couldn't figure out how that was actually implemented or used. Um, so it doesn't seem to have been able to overcome that burden to be able to actually empty pits. In terms of resources, insufficient financial materials and material resources were often cited as leading to poor quality latrines and then latrine failure. This was cited across all approaches, but particularly among the CLTS water incentive, and also across all approaches, um, people noted that this was most difficult for those who were the poorest in their community. Another key takeaway is that there was also limited to no sustained movement up the sanitation ladder. So if the PEPM USAID promoted latrines were used and they were done so um, among household members, so privately, this would have represented a step up to basic sanitation. But it doesn't seem that those, when they're repaired or replaced, that everybody is, is, is meeting basic sanitation access. And so now I'm going to share uh, one more quote that kind of encapsulates what we heard frequently and most especially in CLTS water incentive villages, and it's from a natural leader from one of those villages, who said, there is no challenge except that the latrine models, they, so PEPM USAID promoted, do not last. Every two years we build them, and is it at this level that I appeal to them? We really need financial or material support to be able to build modern, sustainable latrines. So, Without further ado, let's move on to the, to the last sanitation slide, and I hope that, that this kind of draws together many of the findings that we've seen already. And what we'll do is go from left to right again, looking at these, these four figures, some of which you've seen before. 
And, and what these figures show us essentially is a trade-off as we go through and look at them. So the first one appears to be in use based off of observation. We see that the CLTS water incentive performs the best here and, and notably better than the hybrid approach specifically. For the second figure, if you look at any latrine with a slab, we see that then the CLTS drops off and the subsidy approach performs the best, but the hybrid approach is not too too, too far behind. It is a bit higher than, than the um, CLTS water incentive. Looking at the third figure, so private improved latrine with a slab, basic sanitation, we've all seen this figure before, but it is it does kind of help tell the story to wrap it up. And, and as we noted before, the hybrid approach performs significantly better than the, um, the CLTS with water incentive approach in terms of basic sanitation. And finally, looking at repaired latrine issues, so the fourth figure, we see that the hybrid villages uh, did perform the best here and that the subsidy lagged quite far, quite far behind um, for this. So to wrap up, really, I think what the takeaway is here and what you can see from these figures is that this trade-off did appear to occur between latrine quality and use. And while the CLTS with water incentive approach seemed most effective at encouraging use, the poor quality of the latrines in these communities did not commonly meet the requirements for basic sanitation service, which is important in the sector. And then in subsidy and hybrid communities, most respondents qualified as having basic sanitation service or more so than CLTS ones um, and more frequently reported repairing or replacing their latrines. But their actual use appeared to be lower. You know, in the past, many wash many in the wash sector have viewed sanitation subsidies and traditional CLTS as diametrical. However, the PEPAM USA um, hybrid approach is an example of a shift in thought uh, that these approaches can be complementary. So let's move on to hand washing. To orient everyone to the infrastructure uh, gains made by PEPAM USAID, there were 4,925 hand washing units installed as part of the activity. Hand washing station observation indicated that 6% of households had fixed hand washing stations, of which a tippy tap would fall into that category. However, notably, there were no tippy taps to be observed. And a majority of hand washing stations were mobile devices, such as pitcher and basins that were used prior to the activity starting. And this aligns kind of spot on with the qualitative findings, which I'll share in a moment. And also, while well, 85% of respondents reported washing their hands with soap and water, only 38% um, of hand washing stations had observed signs of use. And to wrap this slide up, let's look at the figure on the right of your screen. And what we see is this is households with observed soap and water for hand washing by approach. And when we look at this, we do see that the hybrid approach at 39% is uh, at, you know, 10 percentage points above subsidy and then um, several above the CLTS approach as well for having soap and water. And now let's 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 share this qualitative quote with you. It's one of, one of my favorites um, that does encapsulate uh, what what people were feeling about the tippy taps. And so this um, natural leader from a CLTS water incentive village said, as soon as the tippy tap breaks down, I notice that the tippy taps are not recommended, but we have replaced them with other ways of washing by replacing the tippy taps with basins, pots, kettles, etc." And so, um, you know, it, it, it's just pretty evident that tippy taps are not being used for hand washing and, and they, they were not able to be sustainable long-term in this, in this um, situation. Moving on to factors that affect sustainability related to hand washing, what we see is that um, I think as many in the sector know, the FAST and SAR approaches have weaknesses and this is just another data point for those. Uh, critical times for hand washing are well understood but not necessarily reportedly practiced. So as you can see from this figure, only 81% of people say that they're washing their hands um, before eating, and then that drops you know, to 73% for after using the toilet and to the 50s for other critical times. Also, we found quite a bit in the qualitative research as well that there's a reported need for sustained behavioral interventions. And we, as an evaluation team, when we go to these communities, we do try to go to communities that haven't had add-on wash activities, but we know that's not always possible. So we do ask specific questions to understand what has happened. And what we found was a statistically significant and positive correlation between other wash activities occurring or being carried out in a community since um, since the, the Pepin USA activity started and signs of hand washing. And this wasn't the case for any other behaviors related to water or sanitation. And so that, that's important to note.
And I'll wrap up, you know, the, the findings for the hand washing section with a quote from a natural leader from a CLTS water incentive village, and then we'll move on to can't implications. And so what this, this natural leader said was, what has not worked is the fact that people from this project who come to teach the, us these practices, they didn't come back later to at least refresh our thoughts. If you show or learn things to people and you stay for years without coming back to refresh their ideas about what has been done, people will eventually forget what they have learned. It would be interesting to follow up with people until they assimilate what they have learned. And that's from a natural leader. And with that, we'll move on to the key impl implications and recommendations. Uh, so, you know, from this evaluation, what do these findings mean for USAID and what might they mean for the broader sector? And most importantly, what steps might we be able to do to move forward to more durable wash solutions? And so first, I, I just want to say that we, we recommend consider building on the hybrid approach. So this was the combined CLTS and subsidy approach for future rural sanitation service programming. It may not be perfect in every country. Some countries are moving towards uh, private sector approaches. All that to say, it certainly is worth considering if it's appropriate for the context. Certainly, though, a, a attention would need, be need to pay to increasing use um, and, and promotion of that use of those, those latrines. In terms of um, water management, we recommend considering alternative models for small-scale water point management and governance. I think Boley may speak to this in a moment, but the government of Senegal is moving towards uh, private sector management of the larger ASU4, so those multi-village water points, and there may be worthwhile uh, learnings from there that could be applied to, um, to these smaller scale water management committees. As we saw, the, the tippy-top um, was not very sustainable. And so we recommend considering incorporating human-centered design to hand washing stations in future projects. Also worth noting, and I imagine Boli will speak about this, uh, the, with, prior to our, our findings coming out, the mission at, at USAID Senegal has already done this, but we do think this is an important finding for the larger sector to hear as well. And then for the final bullet point on this slide, we recommend to continue to engage in private sector partnerships that foster local capacity building and entrepreneurship training. And so while the specific plans for, for um, that PEPM USAID had in place in terms of contracts and things like, like that weren't sustained, they still, uh, these private sector entrepreneurs were still valued and, and a resource to these communities. And for our final implications and recommendation slide, we just have three more points. Specifically, we recommend um, that in terms of behavior change, that there be a shift to supporting system strengthening for sustained championing, championing of WASH behavioral norms. So to, to kind of work with governments to move towards self-reliance so that uh, host governments have these stronger systems and are able to support at the local level uh, those people that are needed to help change behavioral norms, whether they be activists, CHWs, or whatever, whatever their name is. Uh, secondly, we recommend that uh, USAID conduct a cost-benefit analysis of the water point pumps as well as the borehole options and the three sanitation implementation approaches. As I mentioned, um, PEPM USAID has a significant amount of costing data that could be built on uh, to, to create further nuance and understanding there. And finally, this is a mouthful, but, but it is important. We recommend that um, USAID support adaptive management recommendations in midterm evaluation reports. Uh, specifically to follow up and ensure that implementers have the flexibility they need to make course corrections. And so this is not um, a critique of PEPM USAID, but of the larger you know, sector itself that sometimes midterm evaluations do find issues and because of contractual obligations or other issues, those course corrections aren't able to be made. So trying to make sure that that flexibility is there. And next, I just would like to thank everyone for their attention and for, for listening to this presentation. Um, on behalf of our evaluation team, which consisted of Al Yoon Watt, Grace Tang, Carrie Nelson, and Leslie Hodel, uh, thank you. And with that, uh, I will hand it over to you, Abby. Thank you. Thanks so much, Holly. Um, I'd like to turn now um, to our colleague in USAID Senegal, um, Boli, who leads the WASH portfolio, um, to talk through uh, sort of reflections on, on this ex post evaluation and also how um, the portfolio has evolved um, in the years since PEPM USAID closed. Hi, hello everyone. I'm Abdullah Boli from Senegal. Uh, thank you very much, Holly, for the very good presentation. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of things have changed now uh, 
between the end of the project and uh, also the new portfolio that USID Senegal is implementing. And those change also was linked about three main factors about framework at the international level with the sustainable development goals set up to really cover the universal access and also improving service delivery. Now we are talking about safely manage. The context of USID path one was in the Millennium Development Goals, where it was more focused on improving access or giving access to to new communities or, or household or, or villages to be able to have access to those water and sanitation facilities. And also we we are promoting now a market-based approach because we identify uh, that we have more needs uh, for sustainable and also a demand driven model for water and sanitation service provision uh, to overcome the bottlenecks that this uh, evaluation has shown us. And now with the flagship project access, we have clients rather than beneficiaries because it's a difference when you are targeting people if you, if they are beneficiary, you are giving them something. But if they are clients, they are asking for uh, for something. It's very different. And uh, last about the framework is about a strategic ongoing reform in Senegal in the West sector that is offering more private sector engagement to improve uh, service delivery in water and sanitation. Uh, the most notably change is about water management, where the government is shifting about a centralized lies government manage, management to a more private sector led model. Uh, we have example of the national sanitation strategy that is aligned with this uh, promotion of the market-based approach. And also for the water sector management, we have delegation of service uh, providers where the, the, uh, the government is giving contact with private operators to operate in a large area where they can manage those water systems. And in terms of learning about USID PEPAM uh, provided us uh, when we were designing the new pad and also the, uh, the new program or the appraisal document, we, we have changes like about the choice of instrument. We moved from a cooperative agreement who was the, the first, because USID uh, PEPAM was the first flagship, flagship project in Senegal and it was a cooperative agreement. And we learned that with cooperative agreement uh, flexible and adaptive management is, is sometimes very tricky. We, we want to have more control on the project implementation and give more technical direction if needed. It's why we shifted from cooperative agreement to a contract. And also for the targeting strategy, as I said, we have clients rather than beneficiaries for the flagship project access, and we focus on really demand-driven uh, approaches where we have human-centered design of latrine in the core of activity of businesses that is running this part of the market-based approach. We engage now more with the local private sector. We are not creating those firms, but we are supporting existing ones in terms of marketing strategy, innovations for technology and sales force. We also work on the financing option available for the private sector. We are not giving subsidies to the private sector, but we are facilitating, facilitating uh, access to fi financing and also technical assistance to be credit worthiness. And at least we have a working, more closer working relationship with the host country uh, part. Uh, in with USID PEPAM, it was like the IP's implementing partner was leading the policy dialogue agenda. But now we, with our government to government mechanism, we have more closer relationship with the government of Senegal and we have embedded uh, program in those due to due to support reform. And uh, for the sale test, we, we use sale test community lead total sanitation as an entry point to really design the sanitation marketing strategy for the access, the flagship access program. Here are the things I wanted to share and uh, just waiting for your questions or clarity if needed. And also uh, saying again, thank you for everyone who is listening for this webinar. Thanks so much, Bully. Um, I'd like to turn now to sort of some of the questions that have been coming in um, during uh, this webinar. And let's start off with kind of this broad question about how these results relate to other WASH evaluations globally. Um, 
it, is there anything that stands out that's better or worse than elsewhere? Um, in other words, was there anything that was not expected based on similar experiences in other countries' areas? Uh, Holly, I don't know if you could take a stab at this, um, maybe not framing within WASH evaluations globally, but within the context of our series. Sure, yeah, I, I'd be happy to take take a first stab and then feel free to, to add on, Abby. Um, so in terms of, you know, if we break it down by, by water, sanitation, hygiene, I think our, our findings, uh, especially with water and, and hygiene, do align with what we have seen um, uh, in, in other evaluations that we've done in rural contexts as part of this ex post evaluation series. Uh, so that being uh, the water point functionality being at around, you know, somewhere between 50 and 60 percent, which also aligns, it does, that does align with the broader literature in rural water supply. Uh, in terms of when uh, several of the, the activities that we've evaluated also have relied on this FAST or um, SAR approach, one or the other or both, and we have found consistently, which I think is also known more broadly in the sector, so not surprising, that it does not appear to be effective uh, enough at catalyzing long-term behavior change. So there, there, you know, there are several points along the way where, no, none of this is shocking or mind-blowing, but what it is, is it's a very helpful piece of information because we're not just going back, you know, uh, immediately after the project and doing an online survey and saying, well, we went from here to here, we're going back several years later. And so I think what these ex post evaluations do is they add um, one more piece of data that goes to long-term sustainability and what things look like long-term. And I think that that's uh, very valuable. In terms of sanitation, um, the the hybrid approach uh, has it, it has been used other places, but not widely. And so that is for this particular evaluation to be able to look at that. That was unique across our series. Um, you know, we've looked at CLTS um, implementation across other rural um, areas, but the hybrid approach and the findings related to that uh, are, I think, somewhat unique. I don't know, Abby, if you'd like to add to that. Yeah, I think they're somewhat unique um, in terms of the series, but they do conform with sort of the emerging consensus, I would say, uh, in terms of, of maybe the right mix of subsidies to um, to try to improve, um, push people up the sanitation ladder. Um, which is maybe a good transition to um, a few sanitation questions that came in. Um, uh, Arvel asks, uh, can you discuss what issues households identified that made the PEPM latrines fall into disrepair? Did households identify what they meant when requesting modern latrines? Uh, is this plumbing or uh, a Seagal improved latrine? Holly, can you take a stab? I can, yes, yeah, sorry, I was on mute. Um, no problem. So yeah, let, let me answer the, the first part of that question. And, and the first um, is just one point of clarity. So when people were talking about PEPM latrines, it wasn't always easy to tease out if they were specifically mentioning the PEPM USA, so the three types of latrines that were promoted by PEPM USA that had slabs and you know superstructures, et cetera, uh, versus PEPM USA in, in the CLTS communities also just promoted to build latrines. They didn't need to have the slabs per se. So it, it was sometimes hard to tease that out. So I would put that caveat before I give this answer. The, the second point though that I, I would make is that in terms of latrines falling into disrepair, they often cited uh, typical issues that we hear, right? Um, soil issues, uh, latrines collapsing, rains coming, uh, th things of that nature. And then, you know, sometimes, although less so cited, uh, misuse by, by people. Uh, so that that was the most common, those were the most common reasons that, that we heard that latrines were falling into disrepair. Uh, but also they would often cite the quality of what was the superstructure or um, what was used to make the the floor or the, the you know lacking cement things like that so that that hopefully answers the first part of the question in terms of the second part of the question trying to understand what households meant when they were requesting modern latrines that that is a little difficult to interpret um, without fully going back to the data but my impression uh, based off of doing the qualitative analysis is really that they they were probably just asking for or requesting more 
durable and sturdy latrines with actual superstructures often. Um, and so, yeah, I, I can get back to you on that, Avril. I, I saw that you were able to ask that question. I'd be happy to give you uh, follow-up information, but I'd have to look at the data. Thank you, Abby. Thanks, Holly. Um, and another participant um, asks about sanitation marketing in general. And um, Bully, this might be a, a good question for you because I know XA um, has, has focused on this quite a bit, building off of the PEPM USAID experience. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think uh, for the question about uh, change of in terms of uh, marketing-based approaches, is it right? Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, uh, I think that's that, uh, yeah, I think it is something that we integrated in the design of the new project is like how we can use this human centric design process to really uh, uh, assess the need of uh, communities and also household because we are more focused on household now where, where people are purchasing their latrines, how they want to see those latrines to be. And uh, just to avoid the, this kind of uh, uh, misunderstanding between uh, project offering latrines and uh, people requesting those latrines themselves. And uh, now we, we, we are seeing good progress in this program and we just come for the field where we, we, we see this connection between the businesses and also household, how uh, that fit from the demand side and also on the supply side. Uh, what are the technology available to, to overcome the, the, uh, those issues? Thanks, Polly. Um, there's also a question on the budget, and um, Carrie, I'd like to turn this to you about what is sort of a typical budget for SI to perform studies such as these. Great, thank you, Abby. So, I, so I, I'm a technical director here at um, Social Impact. Uh, I've also worked on the donor side, um, overseeing M&E as well, so kind of have that perspective um, as well. And ultimately, so, so the question was kind of about what, what does the M&E budget look like vis-a-vis, -vis, say, a project budget? And ultimately, unfortunately, this may not be as precise of an answer as, as you might be hoping for, but it ultimately depends. Uh, depends, are you including both the monitoring component in that, you know, looking at you know, monitoring indicators, how many people did we train, how many water points did we install, you know, th things like that, or are we just talking about evaluations? Um, or are we talking about both? And then it also depends on what type of evaluation you want. You know, so, so for example, in this series, we've been doing purely ex post evaluations. So we were not involved in say baseline data collection or any data collection around the end of the project. We were just coming in after, several years after the end of the project, doing a single round of data collection and then basing our evaluation on that anything that may have been done by others prior to that and so you know the cost for you know something like the the types of evaluations we're doing here um, are going to be much less than say if you're wanting to do an impact evaluation um, you know where you have multiple rounds of data collection most likely you have a, a little bit more intensive work in terms of the types of analyses that, that are going to be needed uh, most likely also sample sizes um, tend to be much higher in impact evaluations, et cetera. So, so there are, there is a lot of variation there um, in terms of what the likely costs are going to be. Um, I have heard tossed around and, you know, there there's all sorts of debates about how, about what exactly the right percentage is, but I have heard around two to three percent in terms of covering monitoring and evaluation costs. Um, again, unfortunately, there is some variation, you know, very um, infrastructure heavy uh, projects that, that tend to have much higher costs. Um, perhaps the percentage needs to be a, a little bit lower to, to manage that, whereas something that's more on the quote unquote soft side interventions may have 
uh, lower overall costs than say an infrastructure evaluate or project. Um, and so therefore the percentage may be a little bit higher. Um, but, but that might give you kind of a, a ballpark figure of what you might be looking at for ME costs. Thanks, Carrie. Um, while you were speaking, another question came in um, related to hand washing with soap. Um, and the question is, uh, thanks for collecting the total water fetching time per day. Do you see this uh, as a, a barrier to hand washing with soap or, or were there other water sources commonly used for, for hand washing? So yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to try to answer that. Thank, thank you for that question. It, it is a great question. Um, it, it wasn't one that we fully explored in the evaluation, if that was an actual uh, barrier so it's hard to answer I can certainly give you my my best guess and you know based off of the the use slide of what Pepham USA water points were used for about 70% of the time they, they used them for household um, uses of largely hand washing you know laundry things like that and so in Senegal and and Boli please feel free to jump in in Senegal we we did see at least in the southern region that there are often wells nearby and so those would sometimes be used for hand washing as well, not necessarily just the Pepham water point. And so I think it largely just depends on the individual households and and I think their time, you know, needs and and other um, behaviors and barriers that may be going on. And I'll hand it back to you, Abby. Thanks, Holly. Uh, Bully, did you want to add anything on hand washing? Uh, no, I think that the hand washing also depend on the on the behavior change or the communication strategies that the project had and as uh, mentioned in the report about fast SRR methodology you have some weaknesses when people just give one training or one communication campaign in a village and they have not follow up actions to really see the, uh, to show to population the importance of behavior change and sometimes we have sky uh, it's common in, in rural area, people can have like uh, basins where uh, potel or kettle, kettles to do the hand washing stations, but not the tippy tap was not adapted at the social uh, or cultural norm of, of those populations. And we learn it from our, our experience and now we are integrating this in the, in, the, in, the, in the implementation of access program about all the behavior change camp campaign, about the cell test as entry points that build those kind of behavior at very lusty and long term sustainability of, of, of those interventions. Thanks, Boy. And um, finally, there's a question about, um, I think that I'll try to field um, about uh, whether USAID has done any ex post evaluations on uh, disaster risk reduction projects. And I would say, uh, not to my knowledge, um, I think this series um, is sort of the largest USAID investment uh, in ex post evaluations um, across the agency. Uh, there have been um, other ad hoc ex posts done uh, on Food for Peace programs, and I know um, there also was one done in Malawi on um, a Feed the Future activity. Um, but to my knowledge, uh, they haven't been rolled out across um, USAID's um, broad portfolio, and it would be quite interesting to do one uh, on a disaster risk reduction activity. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, thank you. And um, with that, we're, we're about out of time. Um, I, I do want to thank everyone for joining us um, today. And if you do have any uh, follow-up questions, please don't hesitate uh, to reach out to me uh, or Holly. Um, our email addresses are there. And we certainly, uh, if you have a question for another uh, panelist today, uh, we'll be happy to link you up um, to Boley or others. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and with that, I think we're going to close. Thank you.